you add points on your map. So you could add slides as we go, which we will be doing. We can add an image or a video, we can add text, and then we have some map options. So let's, you have to scroll down a little bit to be able to add your location. So first let's add a title and some text to the first slides. These slides are gonna be sentences pulled directly from the article that we're using for our example. The titles I'm adding just for demonstrative purposes, um, they're, they're purely descriptive. So I had the Saints arrived, and now I add um, two sentences in the paragraph. And this is the first point in my map tour. Brigham Young began efforts to secure printing press and type even before he reached Salt Lake Valley in 1847. Equipment arrived in 1849, and editor Willard Richards, now coincidentally accounts Utah's first newspaper on June 15th, 1850. I do just have a warning that my internet connection is unstable, so um, hopefully if I start to cut out, someone will warn me. So we're gonna add a location. Basically, uh, you just do it by search. So you'll type in in this upper right-hand corner, search by location. We're gonna look for Desert News, which today is at 55 North, 300 West. And we're gonna go ahead and use that even though potentially um, in 1850, that was not where they were located. I was unable to find a precise address. <laughs> Many times these old newspapers are housed in buildings like the Collins House. And it that may or may not be possible to track down today. Which house in 1850 was the Collins House? So we're gonna search by location for 55 North 300 West. It's gonna pull it up here. That looks right to me. I'm gonna click add to map. So now we have our first location. It's that big blue one. An important uh, part of the control that we have here as authors is to control the zoom level, which is the, the zoom on the map that it'll automatically go to as your reader scrolls through the experience. So we're gonna turn it on and we're gonna zoom out a little bit. So this is probably zoom level five or six. This is zoom level 12. So we've zoomed out a little bit. The higher zoom level numbers are more zoomed out. That looks good for now. I mean, it doesn't really make sense in isolate. It makes more sense in context as you flow from one location to another. So we'll keep this at 12. We'll click add location. All right, we've got a location. We've got a little bit of text. Let's add an image or video, browser files. I've got this handy photo of the Mormon pioneers at South Pass. I think this is in Wyoming. Um, probably a familiar photo to some of us. You know, there's a few really, really classic photos that circulated. We're just gonna use this um, for now. Let's get a picture of what it might have looked like when the Saints arrived. So now I've completed our first step. You can see, again, it is very close to a slideshow, just with this heavy map integration. Keep going a few more times, and we've got a map tour. So now I've, I've jumped forward eight steps, I have eight slides. And this is just converting the first several paragraphs of that article into um, an interactive map that's gonna guide its reader back and forth across these locations. In this case, in a fully chronological order. But you can see the map itself is a little bit bland right now. It's just uh, black, black lines on white with blue dots. And we do have some options there as well if we wanna give it more visual as well as informative uh, flair. So if we go to our map options, you can see now we have basically two options. Well, we have three options. We can configure it to our current location, um, but that's not necessary for us right now. And we can select our base map, which is the, the map that it uses um, as, its, as its basic layer. And we can change our point color. The blue point color doesn't bother me. I'm gonna stick with that, but I'm gonna change my base map. So I'm gonna click there and it's gonna bring up this menu with about um, 15 options, 18 options, I suppose. And you can see they definitely changed the look of the map. There's uh, satellite imagery, there's like textbook map imagery, but they also do change the amount of information that it presents. There's topographical maps. I often favor the information heavy ones, but in this case, 
just for style. Let's try this one down here. It's called the modern antique map. It looks kind of appropriate for our topic. So we'll go with that. We'll click done there. Now that looks pretty good. So we'll get a chance to explore this map to ourselves in a minute, but for now, let's keep moving. You can see you scroll down and you just continue your story. It's that simple. You can always find those plus marks and just add something new. And of course you can add um, before and after other modules and you can always move modules around. So now I've dropped in another paragraph from the text. The Utah papers were representative of American frontier journalism in other ways as well. While an enterprise and printer might start a paper with a relatively small capital investment, keeping it going in the face of isolation and competition proved more challenging. Publishers constantly pleaded with subscribers to pay their bills and often had to accept payment in produce or services. Most papers had brief lives, even when their owners operated related businesses like job printing plants or shops selling books and office supplies to subsidize them. Small staff, sometimes consisting of only one or two persons, led to a reliance on exchange publications from which editors borrowed large numbers of items. Or they might use pre-printed pages supplied by syndicates for the inside or outside of the normal four-page publications. Sort of a transitional text. The next part of the article after that paragraph zooms in a little bit now on the editorial feuds of Ogden, just a little bit north of us. So for that section, we'll try a different interactive element here, a little bit less map dependent one, the slideshow. And we'll see how um, this compares, but also quite contrasts with what we just did. So similar interface, but no longer map oriented, it doesn't even give us the option to add a location. So we're gonna add some text. I'm not gonna add titles here because I just can't come up with any that, that meaningfully contribute to the text. What I'm gonna do is just break up um, this one paragraph from the original source material into its constituent sentences and then make each sentence into a different slide. Because this is gonna zoom in on a more biographical section of the text. And because it's more biographical, we don't really need uh, the map element of the map tour. However, it would still be good in the more traditional narrative sense to locate our readers in where this biography is going to occur. So we are gonna add a map And when you add a map, you can see it brings you right into ArcGIS. So I have a couple different maps here. I have my Open Wounds map that I'm working on, but I also have one that I've made for this purpose called Early Utah Newspapers. But that one's not really ideal for right now either. So we're actually gonna try clicking up here and building an Express map. An Express map is just a quick, easy way to map out, draw some features um, and make your own map just for whatever module you're working in at that moment. So we're gonna search for Ogden, Utah up here. It's gonna bring us to Ogden. We're gonna click add to map. And that's, we're pretty happy with that, to be honest. That's kind of what, what we just need to get started. And I can see once you've added a feature, whether you search for it or you've drawn it, you can add an image and a description and change the style. So we will add an image to see what happens. I added this historical with the graph of Ogden. We're gonna click on our, our options here. And we're gonna see that we can change our base map again. So let's, let's try that because that white one really doesn't do as many services for the purpose of this narrative. In this case, as you can see, I've already jumped ahead and tried the satellite one because it gives us an accurate contemporary representation of what the area looks like. So this is functioning a little bit more in traditional setting work to locate our reader um, into the, the action of our characters. We're gonna click this plus down here in the bottom right and add a new slide. Now we're gonna move into uh, a character named, I guess, Lee Freeman. And this, this spell is very interesting and I actually encourage you all to um, potentially look him up more. He was something of a character of the West in general. Um, but we're gonna add his sentence here. 
I mean, because it's about a specific man, we're going to add his portrait. Now, this portrait is, as most portraits are, portrait oriented, which means more vertical than it is horizontal. And you can see it doesn't really want to fit in that well with our landscape oriented slideshow. There's a couple problems with it. He's kind of awkwardly placed and our slide text is obscuring his face. So we do have a couple things to, to attack this with and we, we probably will be doing that often as we work on our story maps. Um, we're gonna click the gear again, go to our settings. And we're back in our image options which we've seen before. I'm definitely gonna pull this focal circle up. So you can see slight change. That's about the best we can do right now though. And it's a little bit better. His eyes are, you know, his face is more centered on the page, but it's actually even harder to read now because the slide title is just completely obscuring half his face. So we're gonna click on this little art palette icon and that's gonna give us our slide options. And we have three things here. We can change the color, which essentially in this case really just means changing the transparency. You can see in the bottom left an example of what that might look like. It can be a pretty nice effect, especially for variety, but sometimes it can affect legibility. And in terms of accessibility, it's really important that we keep everything as legible as possible. So we're gonna stick with the black text on white right now, but we are gonna change the position. We're gonna click horizontal position and move it over. Now that's much better. Everything is legible. The photo itself could probably still be adjusted or manipulated um, in, in terms of its placement, but that's gonna require going to a photo editor. We can't do any more work here in Story Maps. So we're gonna click and now on a third slide. It's another biographical slide. Now I move into sort of the other side of this feud, uh, Leo Hefeli, Hefeli, I'm not sure how you pronounce these names, uh, <laughs> referred to, um, another editor's Hey Dude. So that was very contentious at the time. Um, and this was very controversial fight between the editors, but I don't think there was an actual duel. No one was actually shot. So everything is more or less as good as it can be for now. We've kept our slide title to the right, although it does obscure um, Leo's uh, presumably wife. We could also try centering it, but then that's gonna obscure Leo. So we're gonna leave it where it is and we're gonna call it a day for this slide. So this <clears throat> finishes up our biographical segue into Ogden. Now we're kind of starting to run out of source material. So we're gonna have to try to wrap up um, this demonstration a little bit. The second half of this article is gonna focus on uh, radio and, and TV broadcasting before it comes back into the uh, newspapers today. As Utah journalistic institutions move through the 20th century, they reflected national trends. Daily newspapers perished or consolidated and both dailies and weeklies affiliated with publishing groups. While Salt Lake dailies remain in private ownership, others did not. Provo's Daily Herald joined the Scripps League, a group of 48 papers, and Logan's Herald Journal became part of the Pioneer Newspaper Group, a smaller chain. The Sandusky Newspapers of Ohio bought Ogden Standard Examiner. The Daily Spectrum of St. George, Utah's first daily in 70 years, belonged to the Thompson Newspapers Group, along with 166 other dailies. Many of the state's weeklies also belonged to groups. Others handled printing or distribution jointly, as did Salt Lake's dailies under a joint operating agreement in effect since 1952. Now, for those who have just lived in the area, we probably can sense that there's more to the story in terms of uh, Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News potentially, and how that relationship has played out over the years. But unfortunately, we're not gonna really get to dive into that for, from this article. So we're gonna just uh, see what we can do here. I'm gonna scroll down. And I think we should try adding a swipe. So a swipe is a feature that maybe we've seen before in newspaper articles that we've read online, or um, even maybe when someone's trying to sell us something. So maybe our reader's familiar with it. If not, it's just basically allowing us to overlay, overlay sort of side by side, 
two images and allow our reader to swipe back and forth to reveal one or the other. So it allows a very direct comparison. It's really useful with mapping. Um, you can really show, for example, if you overlay uh, imagery of the Great Salt Lake from, from 50 years ago to today, you can really see the changes over time. In this case, we're gonna just see what happens when we drop in two different copies of a newspaper. So we're gonna put in a copy of the Salt Lake Tribune acquired from the Library of Congress from about 1900 on our left. So you add an image, you drop it in, and then it kind of automatically adjusts to what you gave it. And then on the right, we're gonna add the cover of an issue from more recent years. Now the these two photos, as they are manipulated already, pair a little bit awkwardly, but they're actually pretty close because the basic format of the newspaper has simply changed over time. And so now your reader can click in the middle there and scroll left and right and compare what, what the Salt Tribune looked like 100, 100, or 100 years ago versus today. And then you can add a caption. And that's about as far as we're gonna get. We're gonna add a map simply because we have it. We're gonna add this early Utah newspapers map. And when you add your own map, you do have a little bit of control. You can control what layers you put in. So on this map, all I've done, this is not a comprehensive map, is select um, manually, basically all of the newspapers that are mentioned in this article or in adjacent sources that came up while I was reading about this article particularly. And I put them in and I color coded them according to basically whether they were LDS affiliated or not, because that was basically the, the dichotomy, the political dichotomy. And if I didn't know what their affiliations were, such as this little one year press that operated up in Alta, I left it green. So in a lot of cases, affiliation basically just means whether the editor was or was not a member of the church. But of course, as we can imagine, the consequences for that were fairly large. I have a messy map here. It's a lot of layers I don't need because I was just experimenting. So you can see with these little closed eye icons, they're all closed. I only have one active layer. That's all we want. I'm gonna place it. And now when our reader gets to the end of our story, they have a moment totally unguided to just explore the map on, on their own. And you'll see in a moment here that when you scroll over or click around in there, if you click on one of those little colorful balloons, it'll bring up all the information we've already seen, such as when the press was founded, potentially who the editor was, who owned it, um, as well as some other information I was able to scrape up for this demonstration. We have some options here at the top. We can edit it, we can change its placement, we can change its size. You'll see one, that icon second from the left, you can make the map basically just like a little illustration. You can put it side by side other text. So you can really be quite liberal with your use of maps and think of them as um, just minor illustrations as you move through, as well as the major mode of the text if you want. So now, sorry, kind of jumping around a little bit here. The last thing we want we can do to any story map is we do have a credits footer. So this is gonna be really important. We have a heading, So for, for now, I'm just gonna put in what felt appropriate at the time, but I, um, I feel in this case that the standards of the library for attribution are more uh, important than the standards of ArcGIS, for example. So I wouldn't wanna be, I wouldn't be comfortable putting down anything until I'd really ran it by the library first. But just for the purpose of this demonstration, it might look something like this as you start to, to supply your, your sources. You can see this attribution list where you can give the asset and then the credit at the bottom. So this would probably be a good place to put all the attributions that you were not able to put easily in the individual modules because it's not always super clear how to provide those direct attributions. So before I really publish this, I would want to spend a lot more time on the credits here and I would want to run it by the library to make sure I was properly attributed everything I needed to and had the rights to do that. But for now, just for us privately, we are gonna click publish just so we can access it and see what happens. So when you click it, it checks everything and make sure that the maps, so you have all the rights to everything and we do. 
So it's just gonna say, you're published, good to go. And now anyone can read our story map for free if they have a link. So here's a little quick link if you wanna type it in yourself and you're curious, bit.ly slash 300 J-I-E-6. But I'm gonna jump out on my slideshow now. And I'm just gonna to go to the actual thing itself. Um, well, I'm gonna stop and share just long enough to drop a link in here if you'd like to see it. Now I'm gonna go back. So that should be the full link in the chat now. I'm gonna go back. And so now everybody, you know, I would encourage you to click through um, if it's not working, hopefully someone can just shout for me and get a sense of what it means to actually read one of these. So right away, you're gonna see how it's fairly familiar to at least any digital native, and it does scroll very naturally downwards to get you started. So we're going, we're reading, now we're in our map tour. And you can see in the map tour it kind of catches on itself and starts moving you through these locations. And I'm kind of just scrolling at even speed here. <laughs> it's it's la it usually doesn't lag quite as bad. I think it's a mixture of the Zoom and my laptop, and my internet connection. But you can see how it automatically moves you around the map. And this can be a really great opportunity to center your reader, but it can also really disorient them as well. So sometimes it takes a little bit of like play and testing on your own to figure out what most meaningfully moves your reader through this space. Keep going. Again, it's usually a little bit smoother of a scrolling operation on your own, but hopefully maybe you're you're already doing this on your own and getting a picture for yourself. So I'm gonna keep going. And on the slideshow now, it's gonna put, orient itself horizontally a little bit. So you're gonna click and move through. We found our swipe. So if you want, you can swipe back and forth and get that direct comparison. Now we're in our map. And maybe, you know, maybe they just kind of scroll right past, but maybe you spend a little time in here because you can see that the map is fully interactive. So, and this can be, you know, a valuable way to share. ArcGIS data with, with your readers because you definitely have access to some pretty cool stuff here. So I'm going to click. I'm going to see what, what was this. Oh, it looks like this was the Union Vedette, which was a newspaper started at Fort Douglas by a federal captain who came to town. Ostensibly, they came and set up this fort here to protect from um, Native American raids. I'm using finger quotes, but that. Uh, really, he, he wanted access to the mines. And at that time, uh, the church was not very interested in precious metals mining and was actually quite skeptical of these large mines. But the, the federal troops bought up mining claims and then created these newspapers like the Union Vedette almost exclusively to advertise mining claims and to bring in settlers, basically to bring in non-LDS um, outsiders. So... Our article didn't really get into this, but that's where some of my work in mining has taken me. You can see if you, some of these locations have more data than others, but you can see this is all based on a spreadsheet that I put together. You can add quite a bit of information here. So you can actually really, depending on the, the core data sets of your maps, you can add quite a lot to the story. And then finally, scrolling down, They'll see your credits as they exist. Go back up. And I'm going to stop sharing. And that kind of wraps us up. So that, that shows us at least one way to get started transferring, translating perhaps a story from its textual form into a more interactive um, map-based format. And some of the strengths that that has and potentially some of the things to look out for a little bit. Um, and so now, about running out of time anyway here, I, if anybody has any questions, I would love um, 
to field them. Hey, thank you so much. That was great. I just, I asked you all to unmute right now. You don't have to, but I wanted to give you a chance just to thank Daniel because that was fantastic. Yes. Hey, how are you doing? Hey. Well done, thank you. <laughs> and we do have a few minutes. So does anyone have any questions they either want to just go ahead and ask or put in the chat box? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, I was curious, Daniel, I was thinking about something <clears throat> I read in Lisa's class about like remediation. And I was thinking about, you know, like the sort of the idea that, you know, one thing becomes another medium, but that it kind of picks up baggage along the way. So when a, when a map becomes digital like this, I was thinking like what other kind of media show up in the experience of one of these story maps? Is it part video game? Is it part slideshow? And how do you think that affects, you know, like the way they're received? I love that you mentioned video games because I think the interactivity does start to veer into that space. I mean, because the actual experience when it comes to playing a video game is just essentially manipulating a few buttons for information, which really you cannot do, you cannot experience a map without, without doing that in some way, right? You do have to, you physically or digitally, you have to interface with it, move it, flip through it. Um, and so it does bring that into it, but I don't know so much what other options, I mean, how, how else it really speaks to this, the, I don't know, is, is remediation more of a problem for you or is, is it an opportunity? No, it's more just like an interesting phenomena that right. uh, <laughs> like, um, I don't know, like, you know, like think about like what the care, like just different things that you don't even realize sort of like the, maybe it's the camera angle of what you see or like these just the other kind of like uh, artifacts from different media show up into these kind of like new emergent media and they become more of a collage of different things rather than a pure translation into like a digital map in a sense. I think in some ways the pure translation that is attempting to occur through story maps is a little bit artificial and limiting um, in that sense as well because you do, once you start in that space where you do want to be able to really digitally manipulate like the area and, and, and click through and move through like you might in a video game or in a video game map, you also can't do it the way, I, I wish you could do more, like in my head, I can zoom around, I can fly through a space. And potentially a future version of story maps or ArcGIS would allow you to fly through a space, right? Like give you sort of a flight simulator mode. Um, but there are ways in which I think that the experience could be like remediated further, right? And, and there are kind of limitations now that kind of do bound it a little bit more to a slideshow than a video game, for example. Although depending on the, the video game, a point and click video game is very close to a slideshow as well. So you're still, I think it, I think the, the, the media video game specifically is not something I had really considered as much, but it does seem um, to speak to what, what this kind of narrative does, maybe more so than text. Although now that I say that, I would encourage an experimentalist text author to push back on that so did you see what justin Sorensen just said in chat yeah there is flying oh wow justin do you know if that you are able to then integrate that into a story map in the same way you just simply drop in an arcgis map into story map because i i haven't found that yeah, I believe right now the best thing you could do is export like an animation and incorporate mm -hmm. it like a video like you were showing the images and the video. So yeah. that's kind of where they're at right now with the integration between the two. And you can always, as, as, as I didn't really point out, but you might have noticed, as Justin did, you can always add video instead of image in here. And, and so there are more in terms of remediation as well. There are more capabilities with, with sound and video um, than I brought into this demonstration for sure. Well, I have a question for you also, Daniel, but first I just wanted to say I was really impressed with your attention to detail on things like accessibility, attribution, user experience, so well done in that regard. Um, the question I had was whether or not these story maps can be plugged into other systems like WordPress or like if you can embed it or, you know, into like something like a WordPress or Omeka site. I. I, don't, I believe you can, but so far I just simply haven't had to, 
had the opportunity really to do that yet. At some point, I do hope um, I will be needing to provide it through the library, access to it through the library somehow. So we may be making a widget or something like that for it. But I, I think you can. Justin might honestly be able to speak to that better than I can as to embedding. Yeah, you can embed those in WordPress. It's no problem. <laughs> Do you know if it goes into Omeka? If you can just, so I see Max just shared an iframe. So probably. I bet if I played with it, I could just, I'm thinking of, we have that women's exponent project that's currently in Omeka. It'd be fun to do a story map and embed it in that site. So, and, and for, for today, we just looked really like, I, I don't know what I would call like the front end, I guess, of the story maps, but there are a lot of, I think a lot of the pitch of the the technology is in the management system as well behind it and letting you collect the data, collect the maps, and then publish them and share them different ways. So yeah, I think if you got behind there, you, you find that there were some pretty good options. And I, yeah, for me, what I learned and what I took away really is just how, how doable it is. You know, I mean, it's really, it's a very accessible experience. And right away when you start playing with the maps, it, it just, it's, it's just different than, than what we typically do. And I find maps apparently inherently interesting. I didn't realize how inherently interesting I found them until I really got into this material, but I do like staring at maps. So a 20 minute story can become a three hour story just on your own time, immersing yourself in the world. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for those great questions. Um, Max. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Daniel. No, no, that's it. I was just going to say thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you so much to our presenter and um, keep your eye on the Digital Matters listservs because we'll be announcing more events coming up. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. So much. Bye.